Welcome to BizTech's SME show, where we feature SMEs, both small and large, sharing their entrepreneurial journeys and also imparting the lessons they've learned along the way. Now, today's featured company is Systematic Aviation Services, a dedicated aviation company that provides helicopter and fixed wing services in Malaysia. Now, with us to share her experiences is Aida Adora Ismail, the Chief Executive Officer of Systematic Aviation Services, or SAS. Welcome to the show, Aida. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for having me today. It was, I wish we could actually meet in person, but unfortunately, this is what 2021 is. Everything is via Zoom. Uh, we can only see each other this way. And Aida, let's start by giving the audience an overview of what Systematic Aviation services does sure so systematic aviation services we're based in subang airport kuala lumpur uh, we've got a few other branches in sabah and also sarawak but mainly the core business of our company is aircraft maintenance so we're in an mro uh, we started off as that and then we've sort of extended into aviation training we've got our own aoc uh, approval so we do a lot of um, air charters, we do aerial survey, aerial spray, aerial work. So we do quite a variety uh, of things. Um, our training school provides examinations, you know, we do English testing for pilots. So we do quite a range of different things that tailor for the industry. Okay, this business was set up and you're only 28 years old now, correct? I'm not even 28 yet. So I turned 28 in September. So I'm actually still 27. <laughs> <laughs> your business was started by your father. Walk us through yes, how he started right. the business and how you became involved in the business. Um, so, so my father, my late father, uh, he passed away last year in January. But um, back in nineteen, in the early nineties, uh, my dad has always been very passionate about aviation. So you know, he took up he he took up his own PPL. So you know, he was flying with flying clubs. You know, so so that's sort of how he got involved in aviation. And then from there, he thought that maybe he can venture into aircraft maintenance. So he sort of started doing aircraft maintenance for lighter aircraft. So something like the Cessna 172s, the Cessna 150. So he started with the, the smaller air, aircrafts. And then from there, sort of made his way uh, into all the other um, businesses that we have. So I think uh, from there, he ventured on to um, aircraft maintenance for the government. Um, so we do quite a few of government agencies that we do aircraft maintenance for. And then along the way, um, you know, we then extended to aviation training, we extended to um, our AOC, so we then uh, bought our own uh, helicopters, we bought our own set of planes that we then do charter works and also aerial work for people. Um, I came in um, sort of in 2016, so I had graduated my university, um, I was sort of working part time clueless what I was going to do next because I was actually um, abroad and um, and then one day my dad sort of just came over had a big talk and then you know just a few weeks after I had a long conversation over the phone saying that look it is a family business he started from scratch um, and he needs someone to come back and help him so I guess I was sort of, you know, I, I, I was never, you know, I always enjoyed seeing what he does because he was always very passionate. So I thought that, you know, why not give it a try? I uh, came back in 2016. To be honest with you, I actually stayed home for most of the time. I didn't really want to start work yet until he really pushed me into the office. And then, you know what, I, I haven't left. And it's just been so um, enjoyable. The people that I work have been amazing. So I'm um, here and then... Um, got to work with him i think for about three to four years before he got sick uh, and passed away so i think that that sort of gave me enough time to um to learn the traits of the company to meet people so i used to go around meeting people all over the place with him you know we would go for air shows together and he would introduce me you know uh to different things so so my dad was sort of the kind of person who was always like you don't look at malaysia as just the market let's go out. So we used to go to Dubai air show, we'll go to the air shows in Australia, we'll go to the air shows in Germany. Um, the last one that I went with him was in Amsterdam for the helicopter um, air show. And you know, that that sort of broadens your horizon about what, what um, these aircrafts can actually do. So I think um, so that's how I got into it. And I got quite some time to work with him. I wish we had a longer time to work together. Um, but unfortunately, dad, um, 
you know, he was sick with cancer and then he passed on early January. So it's been almost two years now. Uh, so I've now had to continue um, his work. And what have been your challenges since you took over? Um, besides, you know, dad was running this company for what, 25 years. So he, you know, it was, it was all him and his team. And I came in just, you know, sort of less than five years of experience in the company. And, you know, profession wise, I studied accounting and corporate finance. So aviation was definitely not something that I had my head, my head wrapped around. You know, I, I, I could do accounting and finance but aircraft maintainers they were talking about propellers and blades i didn't even know the difference to be, uh, when, when i first started um so so that was a challenge itself so i guess you know um when i took on it was very very soon i think it was just two months after that that the whole world went into a pandemic you know so it's sort of like trying to stay with what my father's goals are which is uh, you know you know trying to fulfill all his visions at the same time going through a pandemic so i think until today that is still the struggle that i go through you know uh, looking after the people that work in the company my father is uh, my my father and both my mom they they when they run a company they're very much engrossed to how they look after the people that work for the company so you know looking after that especially at this moment in time when the pandemic is it is a challenge because you know you, you can't win everything so it's trying to see what the priorities are but definitely at this moment in time it's making sure that everybody goes home uh, and being able to feed their families and how has the pandemic in, impacted you has it been a positive impact or has it been a negative because one of the things that has happened globally is the rise of in demand particularly for private aircraft? Yeah, so um, I would say it's a little bit of both. So there has been, uh, you know, I, I when, when I sit with my management, you know, sometimes we sit there and we feel like we've hit a wall saying that, look, this pandemic is really testing uh, business for us. But then at the end of the day, when we sit down, there are, there are the benefits of it. For example, taking over the company and making sure that it continues to run as it is, is challenging because, you know, my father did not have quite a long time to fully hand over everything to me. So I would say the lockdowns have been also a blessing in disguise because we actually used that time to clean up what we needed to do, to strategize what we needed to do, uh, to de develop products so that when we, you know, when, when the lockdown ends, things open up, then we start going in doing different things, you know? So I would say it's a little bit of both, but again, because it's sort of dragged almost to two years now, you sort of do feel the pinch at the end of the day. Um, okay. But then again, you know, you just got to still keep going, you know, you still have to get through if you want to stay in the industry. And how has the business, so where do you see the business changing in terms of strategy um, because of the pandemic? Uh, to be honest with you, our business model probably changes on a weekly basis. You know, sometimes you plan things way ahead, trying to plan like this is what you're going to do, this is how you're going to do things, and then, you know, the country goes into a lockdown. Like at this moment in time, Malaysia is in a lockdown until further notice. You don't actually know when things are gonna uh, gonna gonna stop. You know, until the numbers of COVID cases go down. So. It, it, it involves a lot of uh, thinking outside the box, you know, how to survive at this moment in time. We were quite lucky that even, you know, we initially we sort of highly depended on overseas market to come in into Malaysia. Um, but we were also blessed that during the pandemic, when the overseas uh, clients weren't able to come in to send their aircraft for maintenance, the local uh market you know the the private sector owners they were buying aircraft because you see at this moment in time secondhand aircrafts are are, are for sale and they're really cheap because people are just trying to sell off assets to downsize so it is a bias market at the end of the day at this moment in time so it is a benefit to sas in that perspective but then of course in the long run we do still hope that you know things will be better so that our overseas clients could come back in again What's the split between your local business and your overseas business? Um, I would say at this moment in time, about 60% local, 40% overseas. Okay, but and that's yeah. changed from previously? And that's definitely changed from previously, because I would say previously it would have been the other way around. So 40% local, 60% overseas. 
Okay, and, and generally, are your, are your customers private customers, corporate customers, uh, or and also the government, am I correct? Yeah, so here uh, in Malaysia, our main clients are the government. We do aircraft maintenance for the armed forces, um, many different varieties, starting from the police, uh, maritime, the civil aviation authority. So we do maintenance for the aircraft. Uh, we've got also a range of private owners, but for overseas clients, they're all private owners. Okay. We do uh, cater for... Um, you know, we've, we've done a few jobs for the Thai police, we've done a few jobs for Indonesian police, um, but that uh, that also is something that we do. But mainly the overseas market are all the private owners. I, I want to zoom out a little bit and take a macro view of general aviation in Malaysia. Could you yes. give us the perspective of uh, first starting off with the light aircraft business and the helicopter business, which, are, which is something that you are very familiar with? Mm -hmm. So something like the light aircraft and also the light helicopters, um, you see the, these aircrafts, they, they aren't like the commercial airlines where they're heavily used for transport. Usually the light aircrafts, they're either used for uh, private usage, you know, so for, okay. for a, a weekend getaway to the island, you know, so those with, uh, with their own PPL private license holders, that's the, they buy these light aircrafts because that's kind of like how they travel around. Same okay. goes with light helicopters here in Malaysia. You have a wide range of helicopter owners that love to go and how we say here, makan, to go and eat. <laughs> so they travel around um, to, to explore to explore the peninsula about where new places, uh, meet new places, eat new food. You know, that, that's what they do. Um, so so here, here in Malaysia, I would say from the time that I was growing up, I used to see a lot more of these aircrafts around. There used to be a lot more... Um, fly-ins that were that were done you know like people would fly in from Singapore from Indonesia from Thailand and they would sort of get together here in Malaysia and then we would travel to their countries and then you know people sort of sit there and show off the aircrafts but right. like if you were to come to Malaysia now like especially in the recent five to ten years you'd see all these aircrafts that were actively flying they're now sort of just long-term parking really you know? why is that because you know, I think Malaysians, both individuals and companies, um, don't realize essentially how affordable flying is actually compared to yeah. some of the cars. Because you can, in an entry level uh, uh, aircraft, is about the price of a three series or a, a Mercedes yeah. C class. And the yeah. maintenance is very low, right? Like a Cessna That's 102. Right. Yeah, it is. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, the regulations have changed over time, the aviation regulations. So I think it's sort of, um, it, it did not spe specify for, for the GA industry a lot. So a lot of these experimental aircrafts, um, a lot of these lighter aircrafts, they did not have a category that they fell in. So I think when, when, when those things incur costs, you know, to, 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 um, to operate a, an aircraft now, it incurs many additional costs to get the approvals. I think people kind of slowed down at the end of the day. Um, you know, and also I feel like um, a lot of the, the, the people are not aware, like how you said, you know, about how affordable all these things actually are at the end of the day. Yeah, could, could you give us a sense of, uh, to our listeners, um, how much does it cost, say, to uh, operate an entry-level aircraft like a Cessna 172? Um, a brand new Cessna 172 will probably cost you only about $300,000, um, you know, to operate it, I would say it would come to a usual range about $20,000 a year or so to operate it. So it's not so it's that like expensive. Operating like, uh, it's like maintaining a BMW 5 Series or something. It from, is at the end of the day. If you do the math, it actually is like operating a BMW, but instead of being able to just drive around the city, um, you can actually fly to the islands on the weekends with your family. <laughs> now, can I ask you, in terms of your predictions, how do you think the aviation, general aviation business will look like once things start to open up? Because overseas, we see a lot more demand for light aircraft, for business jets, because people are afraid. They don't want to fly mm -hmm. on general aviation. And and the reality is, if you have a very light jet like the Embraer Phantom 100 or 300, you can pilot the aircraft yourself. And essentially, the aircraft have range that you can go to Thailand, you can go to Singapore, yeah. you yeah. can fly to Indonesia and so forth. How do you see this 
uh, panning out in Malaysia? I think it only doesn't depend on the people's perspective about aviation. Like I know a lot of that, there are quite a number of younger people, you know, younger generation wanting to invest in this, but then it goes back to what they are called businesses at the end of the day. So, you know, um, aviation, this kind of general aviation um, usually is kind of like a hobby that you have as a, as a yeah. side thing that you do, you know, so it depends on how, the world economy moves you know so if if businesses elsewhere are you know improving and progressing well then people will continue to do this you know because i think over the the years that i've been working in SES, um about five years now i see a lot of younger people entering the the industry you know passionate about flying you know so we we actually get together and we fly together and we can see the like these people do exist but again at the end of the day it depends on what their primary business is you know if um if if the economy doesn't stabilize and they're having to downsize you know the first thing they would downsize would definitely be what their hobby is at the end of the day. Now, idea, do you see fractional ownership where you own a piece of an aircraft and share the cost and the maintenance and, uh, and the ownership of the aircraft? Do you see that taking off in Malaysia? Yeah, um, actually, it, has, it already did. Um, you know, it's already started. We've got quite a number of owners uh, of private aircrafts that share uh, the aircraft. So usually maybe one aircraft you'd have two or three owners that share together. Um, they, they share the operating costs, they share the usage of hours, you know, and, and that seems to be working quite well also. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you won't be flying your aircraft like, like SAS, for example, we are an AOC operator, so we actually yeah. use our aircrafts for high-end reward, whereas these private owners, they don't. So they, they tend to go around and share um, the expense so that, you know, everyone could use it. Sometimes, you know, not everyone can afford one aircraft, so you kind of get together with a couple of friends and, you know, put it together and buy one aircraft and then take turns. And either your experience with your, the private owners in Malaysia, how many hours a year do they, uh, do they utilize the aircraft for flying out? <laughs> when they just purchase the aircraft, you'd see them flying every day. <laughs> 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 you know, because it's something new. So they get very passionate. They it's fly, a new toy. You yeah. Know, yeah, it's a new toy. I mean, I would get excited if I had a new aircraft too, you know fly around, they'll, 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 they'll use it almost every day of the week. And then, you know, um, when, as the months go down, the hours slowly go down. So usually I'd see them using it about 20 hours a month also, depending okay. on the owners, you know. But that also depends on the lockdown. Like, for example, like currently we're in a lockdown, so they aren't able to travel interstate. Right. Unfortunate for us is as soon as you take off from, from, from the airport, you're already traveling into states. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, so, yeah. So, Ida, zooming back into your business itself, what's the size of your business in terms of turnover and, and, and aircraft? Um, SAS, we've got at this moment in time 104 staff that work for us um, throughout here in Kuala Lumpur and also Sabah and Sarawak. Um, I would say the turnover of SAS per year is about two to three million US dollars at this moment in time, but that has also downsized due to um, the pandemic. Okay. And what's the strategy for you moving forward? How do you, because you've taken over, you've, you've had a period where you're digesting and adjusting because it's been hard, right? Uh, your dad used to run this business uh, for so many years since he founded it. Yeah. What are your plans for it um, that perhaps may be a little bit different from what your dad's vision is? Because market conditions yeah. have changed. Yeah. Well, I am actually very, very fortunate because the platform is already there. You know, um, like I mentioned at the, at the beginning of um, this interview, um, SES not only is an MRO, we're also an ATO. Uh, we have our own AOC. We're also a test center. So we do quite have quite a variety of approvals that 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 we hold. Um, but during my father's time, I think the main core business was always MRO. So the other approvals that we had actually supported the MRO businesses. So in the last year and, uh, and a half, what I have been doing is actually making each approval independent on their own because they're all actually money makers on their own, you know. So we're sort of um, 
re-strategize SAS so that every single approval is independent on its own. So I've got a set of managers that manages each approval and then, um, you know, they, they've got to hit the target every month. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, yeah. and so and any final thoughts that you want to leave us with? After all, you're a 27 year old woman who has taken over uh, a business that her father built. Yeah. You're running, you're looking after the livelihoods of a hundred over people. Um, yeah. What advice would you give people who are thrust into a situation that, uh, a similar situation that you've just been thrust into? You just, you just got to do it from the heart. You know, at the end of the day, like if if I questioned myself 10 years ago, would I be doing this? I knew that I was raised to one day take over SAS. But again, I don't think anyone is fully prepared for it. I was not, to be honest with you. I don't think I am. I still sometimes sit down in my office going, what did I just do? <laughs> you know, but then, but then you sort of get up again and be like, all right, no, we've got to move on. You know, the trust in the people that work for you is important. I've got an amazing team that I work with, all very passionate at the end of the day. Um, you know, it is very tough, not just for the aviation industry, for all industries, but you just can't give up. You know, at the end of the day, when I meet different people um, here, even in the aviation industry, I told them we're not in this situation to be competing with one another at this moment in time. I think we're in this situation to be helping each other to make sure that as soon as this pandemic ends, we're also here doing what we like to do best. Now, Ida, it's been a fascinating conversation with you. Thank you very much Thank for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you. Now, I'm Brian Fernandez, and I've been speaking to Ida Ismail, the Chief Executive Officer of SAS Systematic Aviation Services, Sabria Burhan, on BizTax SME Show. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn pages, as well as our website, www.biztech.asia. Please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in.